Arahang Samma Sambuto Bhagava Bhutam Bhagavantam Apivate Mi Grab So Akato Bhagavata Dhammo Amanamasami Supati Pano Bhagavato Savakasanko Sankang Amami Last night, I was teaching in Kajang, and I wore my Upeka shirt from Sukihotu. I actually, I I love those shirts, the Meta Karuna Mudita Upeka. They're nice material and great message. And again, when I wear them overseas, people, you know, ask me. And even I was in Bali, and a guy came up. He said, "Oh, Upeka." He said. You do vipassana? I said, yeah, as a matter of fact, I do vipassana. And then he asked me, I said, I actually teach vipassana. So then we had a big conversation, just random guys. So I think what you wear on your body is not just to look attractive, but in this day and age with printed shirts, you can actually send a message. And it could be something simple like a heart, you know, just wear a shirt with a heart on it and people know what a heart means and they just somewhere someone if you see a thousand people in the day you go to a shopping center or somewhere someone's going to just go oh love oh meta oh or you print a nice word or pr print your own message on your shirts as you can see i'm very freestyle just Actually, what also freestyle means, it's coming directly from the teaching of the Buddha, and that is to live in the present moment. The present moment is your teacher. There is no other way. It's not like, oh, there is another way. You can reflect on the past, but you reflect on the past in the present moment. So I teach forgiveness practice any, as well, which is a very powerful practice for helping us to let go of the past. If you like, you can go to uh, my website, freestylevipassana.com, and on that website you will find my book called Forgiveness for Everyone. It's a very simple book. It's like me, very simple. Uh, it's like the teachings, although the teachings may seem complicated, but they are very simple. So the book is uh, for free download. You can download it and if any of you are having any difficulties with say problems from the past or um, previous issues or such things then the forgiveness is about releasing yourself from the past and the way that's done is by wisdom. Actually this whole path and everything that I'm sharing with you is about wisdom. Wisdom is what transforms your mind. Mindfulness is not, does not transform your mind. It only sees what's going on. Mindfulness is a light. Most of us live in the dark, unfortunately, and we don't know what's happening. So we live in our ignorance. But mindfulness, sati, is a light. And when that light shines on what's really happening, then we see the truth. When we see the truth, then our mind changes. And that's what, that's what takes you to Nibbana, or it enhances your life. It increases the quality of your life. And I am assuming that all of you, in some way or another, would like to increase the quality of your life. 
So, my question that I was going to ask before we reshuffled the room, a question to ask yourself, why am I here? Why did I come here this morning? Take a few minutes, think about it, Why did I come here? You must find at least one solid, significant answer. Not just like, oh, my friend told me, or, you know, my mother sent me, or... Why am I here this morning? You may have many answers to this question. That's fine. You may have one strong answer. Just notice what your mind's doing now. Surprisingly, I opened my eyes and almost all of you have your eyes closed. This is also part of life to think and contemplate deeply about a significant question. Okay, you can think about your problems and find your answers if you want, but I'm talking about a real deep question. Why did I come to this meditation session today? What is my intention? Or simply, what am I looking for? Or a broader question, what do I want? What do I really want? And this is about you, not what does my partner want, what, does, what do my parents want for me? I know you're very, um, your society is very based in following parents and tradition and, and ancestors, etc. That's perfectly fine. But also, sometimes, you have to check in with yourself. What do I want? Because this is your karma. Your karma. Whether you believe you're carrying your ancestors' karma and whether you're, you know, delivering your karma to your children, that's all fine. But in the meantime, you must, you are living by your karma. You are living by your past karma and you are creating your future karma. This is why this question is very important. What do I want? And it's not, I'm not talking about money and relationships and blah, blah out there in the world. What did you come here today to find for your heart, for your karma, for your life? What, and another way to ask this, what is important to me? What is important in my life? Another one. Taking on the reflection of death. What if I knew I would die tomorrow? What would I want to do today? What is important in my life? Somehow we live and we think that we're going to live forever, or at least a hundred years. What do I want to do 
with my heart and my mind before I die. Because there's three things you don't know about death. Where, when and how. And just because you're elderly or older doesn't mean you're closer to death. As you see in the news and in the world, it can happen to anybody, anywhere, anytime. Could even happen today. This gives us urgency, spiritual urgency. What do I want to do with my heart and my mind before I die? Not knowing when we will die. One of my first Buddhist monk teachers, um, Upanyatami, Upinyatami, Upanyasami, used to be in Malaysia a long time ago. Don't know if anyone remembers him. I don't even know where he is these days. Maybe he just went back to Myanmar. Upanyasami. I think it's Upanyatami. He taught me the reflection on death. He taught the whole class. He taught us to repeat. My life is not lasting. My death is sure to come. Inevitable is my death. My life will end in death. Life is uncertain. Death is certain. My life is not lasting. My death is sure to come. Inevitable is my death. My life will end in death. Life is uncertain, death is certain. Thankfully, I was 29, I think, maybe 30 when I heard that teaching. Unfortunately for me, I think it was about 20 years too late. I wish I'd have learnt it much earlier, but that's my karma. I learnt this very precious teaching, I memorised it, I practised it, it actually blew me away because many times in my life I had narrowly escaped death. And then I realized when I repeated this, man, I could die any time. Then what do I want to do with my life? What's important for my life? Doesn't matter whether you're young or old or sick or doesn't matter your religion or your your caste or your class or your race or whatever. Actually, this human body is vulnerable. Very, very vulnerable. Can easily get sick, can be injured, damaged, and of course, we can completely die. So the question is, what do I want? What am I looking for? What did I come here for today? It's not for me to know that question, it's for you to know. And to hold that clearly in your mind and make that your destination in your life. Make that your path for yourself in your life. What do I want? <coughs> What is my intention? So even before you begin to meditate, what is my intention to meditate? Many people just meditate because their beautiful teachers told them to meditate. Or they think, oh yeah, I have got a monkey mind. Okay, I need to meditate. So they sit down, they meditate. <coughs> but they don't know what they're doing. Okay, they got the instructions from the teacher and they're trying to follow the instructions. I understand that. I did that also. But why am I doing it? Am I just doing it because the, the teacher told me? Am I doing it out of faith in the Buddha, the Dharma and the Sangha? Am I doing it because I'm trying to get rid of something? Am I doing it because I'm trying to stop something? Am I trying to stop my mind from thinking? Good luck with that. 
Have you tried to do that lately? Stop your mind from thinking, especially by force? Yes, you can do it. You can force your mind to stop thinking. What I'm going to show you today is how to relax. And through the relaxation, you will actually see that your mind can stop thinking by itself. And this is very beautiful. It's very natural. It's also very relaxing. We'll see. Let's see how it goes. One of my more recent teachers. So, uh, thankfully, I met my first meditation that I met was uh, Vipassana. So I consider I have very good karma. My first teacher was a freestyle Vipassana teacher. He didn't call it freestyle, but he was very freestyle. Western guy who had, um, in fact, his name was Christopher Titmus. He was a Buddhist monk in Thailand. So he learned the very mechanical form of uh, Vipassana. And then um, after that, I met uh, Goenka Vipassana. So that is the 10-day silent course. You, uh, in Malaysia, you have one at Kwantan. I hope many of you have been there to experience the 10-day silent course. If you haven't, please go. Completely different from what you're going to experience here today. Um, so in Myanmar, there are many different types of vipassana. There are, um, my first teacher was um, from the Mahasi Siado tradition. So um, Mahasi was a very famous Siado in, in Myanmar. And from him, he, he create or he had several um, main students or teachers. One was Chamye Siado, Siado Ujanika, who was my teacher. There was Siado Upandita, Siado Ukundala, and I think there were a few others. Very, very, um, a very set way to meditate. That's the rising and falling of the abdomen style of Vipassana meditation, combined with the mental labeling technique. I'll tell you a bit about that later. Then uh, you've got Paok Siado, who's out, uh, he's, um, he's in the east of Myanmar. I don't where, know where he is now, if he's still alive or not. So Paok Siado is, has a very strict also form of meditation, Vipassana meditation. There was Mogok Siado. Mogok Siado took the, the wheel of dependent origination and he took that as his focus of meditation. And so that was also called Vipassana. Sunlun Siado was mainly on breathing, but he was also a type of um, Vipassana. So it's like there are many different techniques and ways of practicing Vipassana. My more recent teacher is Siado Utejaniya. So I think many of you have also heard about him. He is one of the main teachers that guides uh, Bhante Agachita and Bhante Kumara from uh, Sasanaraka Buddhist Sanctuary up in Taiping. So, Siado Utejaniya, he really is freestyle. And in fact, some people don't like him because he's too freestyle. He's too, too loose, too open, doesn't really have a plan. I asked him once, I said, so what do you teach on retreat? He said, I have no formula. I was like, okay, so <laughs> what do the yogis do? And um, he said, well, they do what they want to do. If they want to sit, they sit, they can stand, they can walk, they can do it. But what he's teaching is to watch the mind. Watch your mind. Ultimately, my first teacher came to that point. But they teach you a lot of sitting meditation, walking meditation, standing meditation. And you drill your mind to keep watching your physicality until you get a strong mindfulness. And then you start watching 
your feelings, your mental states, and ultimately through watching your body, your feelings, and your mind, you come to understand the Dhamma. So that's basically the Satipatthana Sutta, which is where Vipassana comes from. Gaya Nupassana, the body, Vedana Nupassana, the feelings, Sukha, Dukha, Upeka, or pleasant, unpleasant, and neither pleasant nor unpleasant. Mental states, Cheta seekers or mental concomitants, the associate mental states that arise and function the mind. And then the, um, the teaching of the Dhamma, the various categories that the Buddha expounded, that when we, when we practice body, feelings and mind, we come to understand the Dhamma. All this puts you on the path to Nibbāna. So it's like the package that the Buddha taught for someone who wants to become enlightened. Enlightened here means free from all kinds of suffering. That was the main point of the Buddha's teachings. Very simply, he said, uh, there are two things. There's suffering and there's the end of suffering. That's the Buddha, what the Buddha teaches. There's suffering and there's the freedom from suffering. Very simple. Or... Another way you, may, you would have heard, avoid doing harm, do only good, and purify your mind. Again, very simple teachings. Avoid doing harm, do good, and purify your mind. Today, we're going to practice these. And of course, then there's the Noble Eightfold Path, which I'm sure you've all heard of and are probably currently practicing. The Noble Eightfold Path is a somewhat wide path, but Satipatthana Sutta is accelerating and narrowing and focusing the path. Vipassana is even going a little bit more focused. So we are um, narrowing the teachings and becoming more focused. So let me guide you in a very simple meditation. Mm. Mm. Actually, I, I shouldn't have used the word meditation. I forgot. Don't use the word meditation. Because if I tell you that we're going to meditate, then you'll be all like, oh, we have to get something, have to fix something, change something, do something, get something, get rid of something. Unfortunately, everybody comes to meditation with our, our package, our um, conditioning. We've been conditioned to what meditation means. And we've all had different teachers and heard different teachings. And we come to meditation and we think that we have to do something, we have to get something, or get rid of something. And in actual fact, you don't have to. I'm going to share with you, and it's along the same lines as I've already been speaking this morning, before we meditate, try this little, I call it a mantra, but it's not really a mantra. It's a, it's a reminder. can be used as a mantra, as in repeatedly, but it's more of a reminder, like a motto. The first one is, even when you sit down, or it can be any time in your life, the first reminder is, I don't know what will happen. I see some of you have brought notes today. I really encourage taking notes. So feel free to write down any little things that you hear or your own insights or questions. Please write them down. I encourage that. The first thing that you say to yourself in your mind, I don't know what will happen. Is it true or not? 
Is it true? Do you know, when you sit down to meditate, do you know what's going to happen? Many of us think that we know, but that's also our pre-programming. Oh, I've meditated before. Oh, I've got my technique. I know what's going to happen. You don't know. It's impossible to know. How could you possibly know what you're, what you're going to experience? But then I apply this to life. This was so refreshing for my life, not only my meditation practice, but also for life when I started to apply this. You wake up in the morning and you say, I don't know what's going to happen today. i got a plan. I'm going to do this. I have to be there at 10 o'clock. I have to do this and that and that and that. But all the details and everything, every sound I hear, every smell, every taste, everything I see, I don't know, every thought I'm going to have, Imagine if you knew what was going to happen. Life would be so boring. You wouldn't get out of bed. You'd be like, yeah, okay, I know what's going to happen today. But then you don't know because you stayed in bed. <laughs> it's a joke. So, I don't know what will happen. When you sit down and you come into your settled sitting position, I don't know what will happen. Even say it a few times. I don't know what will happen. I don't know what will happen. I don't know what will happen. And what you're doing is you're clearing your expectations. You're clearing the path. Whatever path there is. There is no path. But you're clearing your mind. I don't know what's going to happen. The second thing I say is, anything can happen. You wait and see today. At some point today, you'll hear me remind you, or you might even remind me by saying, something's going to happen today, and then we'll go, oh, anything can happen. It means you don't know what to expect. Anything can happen. Now, some people have a tendency on the negative side. So when you say anything can happen, they go, oh no, something bad's going to happen. Oh, it's going to go wrong, it's, it's not going to work, it's, it's going to be bad. And then other people just naturally go to the positive side and say, miracles can happen. Light, beauty, wonder. I'm a little bit that side. It doesn't matter which side your mind goes. Remind yourself, I don't know. Anything can happen. Something wonderful could happen. An absolute catastrophe could happen. Or maybe just something simple in the middle. Not much positive, not much negative. Anything can happen. So again, you're opening up your mind to possibilities. And the third part is, I will just watch and learn from whatever happens. So you're just reminding yourself that life as it unfolds in the present moment is your teacher. Whatever happens now is your teacher. If you get a pain in your bum, that's your teacher. If you're hearing the dog barking, that's your teacher. If I keep talking, that sound is your teacher. Not me, just the sound. <clears throat> if thoughts are running through your mind, like the traffic out there, that's your teacher. We're not saying stop anything. This is a really important point. I assume that most of you came here today because you would like to practice Vipassana and that you would like to know a little bit more about Vipassana. Vipassana is not stopping anything. We're not getting rid of anything. 
This is really important. But we're not trying to get anything. This is also important. So what does this mean? I'm not trying to get rid of anything. I'm not trying to get anything. Sometimes, I think most people in this world, the way we've been trained, that's pretty much all our ego knows what to do. Is to get rid of something or to get something. And it's like, well, what do I do if I'm not trying to stop something and I'm not trying to start something? What do I do? Can you see that this is actually meditation? You come to this point where you are neither stopping nor starting. You are not rejecting and you're not holding on. You're just experiencing, just feeling, just sensing. But the mind is alert, switched on, aware, present. Then it doesn't matter what happens. Anything can happen, it doesn't matter. So our attitude is, whatever comes is my teacher. Whatever arises in my body and mind is my object of meditation. So I'll quickly tell you, this is my teacher's uh, principle of Vipassana meditation. The principle of Vipassana is to observe any mental or physical phenomenon that arises predominantly in the present moment. Once again, the principle of Vipassana is to observe any mental or physical phenomenon, which means mental or physical process, that arises predominantly, and I'll say naturally, in the present moment. So if I sit here, I don't do anything, I just observe whatever arises predominantly. So if you've got a pain in your butt, that's your object of awareness. If you're feeling hot, that's your object of awareness. Some friends over there under the aircon might be feeling cold. That's your object of awareness. When you feel cold, you simply feel the cold. Not thinking, oh, why did I sit here? Oh, I'm so stupid. Oh, I need a jacket. Oh, I better sit over there. Why did they put the aircon on? Blah, 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 blah. That's not meditation. Meditation is now there is cold. Cold is cold. And feel it. If you're hot, hot is hot. Feel it. If you've got tension, pressure, something in your butt, feel it. You feel the weight of the body pressing down on the cushion. Feel that pressure. Just feel the pressure. If you feel the hot or the, maybe the stickiness or sweatiness where you press on the cushion, feel that. Just feel it. So I'm going to lead you into this and teach you how to experience what is happening in the present moment without thinking about it. So first thing I'm going to get you to do is very mindfully, somewhat slowly, mindfully, I'll just ask you to stand up. And we'll have a little stretch. Take your time. Feel the movement. I'll just prompt you through a very simple freestyle vipassana sitting practice. Remind yourself, I don't know what will happen because it's the future and we don't know the future. Anything can happen. Literally anything can happen in the body and mind and in our environment around us.
and just reminding ourselves I'll just watch and learn from whatever happens. In this way we're opening up our mind to any experience. If we were to start with pure freestyle vipassana, you just go straight into the principle. What's happening now? What do you feel now? What's predominant? Is it the cold air from the aircon? Is it the pressure of the body? Is there a pain in the body? Are you hearing sounds? Is it just the process of hearing? Are there thoughts? Is there a stream of thoughts or one main thought? So I'll just give you a tip for those of you who are having a lot of thoughts, which most of us are. A really simple tip is to just say, thinking, thinking, thinking. When you find yourself thinking, just in your mind say, thinking, thinking, thinking. One thing it does, it neutralizes the content of the thought. It kind of, it just makes it a thought. It's just neutral. And you step out of the content. Also, it helps you to see that it's just thinking, it's a process, that's all. And you don't take it personally. And usually, the thought falls away by itself. Thinking, thinking, thinking. So there's no main or central object of sitting vipassana, freestyle. But you can use your breath if you get a little bit lost. So, let me mention a few things that you're probably experiencing or some tips for mindfulness. So right now, feel your right foot. Bring your awareness to your right foot. Notice what your mind is doing now. It probably just became very quiet. Can you feel the big toe of your right foot? Notice your mind focusing a little bit. Can you feel the toenail of the big toe of your right foot? Notice your mind is not in the past, it's not in the future. There may have been a thought about this experience, but it came and went. Now feel your left foot. Can you feel your little toe? Now feel both feet at the same time. This is general mindfulness. Specific was to feel the toenail, the toe. General, feel both feet at the same time. And feel your legs. Feel them pressing down on the mat, on the cushion. Feel your body, your bottom, pressing down on the cushion. Feel the weight of your body being pulled down to the earth. Every moment of your life, you have been pulled down to this earth by gravity. It's always present, like your breath is always present. Gravity is always present. Even you jump in the air, you must come down. You float on water, it's still pulling you down. We don't float in the air. Feel the contact with the cushion. Feel the touching on your skin. Feel the clothes. Feel the heat.
Everywhere you go in your life, you are somehow touching the earth. Even through your shoes, through a car, through an aeroplane, you are being pulled down. There is contact. Notice this contact. You step from foot to foot, is contact. Feel your back straight but relaxed. Can you roll your shoulders up and back and down? Open your chest. Relax your shoulders. Feel your hands, whatever they are touching. Can you feel your left hand separate from the right hand? Can you feel the heat in your left hand? Can you feel the blood pulsing in your left hand? Can you feel the bones in your left hand? Not imagining with your mind, feeling, sensing, sensation. And feel your right hand. Feel the center of the palm of your right hand. Can you feel the energy there? Maybe some slight pressure, maybe a vibration, maybe heat, some energy, some chi. And again, feel both hands, generally, both arms. Again, relax your shoulders, relax your face. As you breathe in, relax your whole body. And as you breathe out, relax your whole body. Start to feel the breath at your nostrils. Feel the cool air coming in and the warm air going out. Can you feel the in-breath Feel the coolness without any thought. Feel the out-breath without any thought. Don't try too hard. Relax and relax again. Trust your mind. As you breathe in, just feel. There's no need to think. Nothing to think about. Feel the in-breath. Feel the out-breath. Let the breath breathe by itself. It does that 24 hours a day. You don't need to assist it. Coolness, sensation, arises and passes away. The warmth appears and disappears. Just feel cool and warm.
forget about the word breathing, forget about the form of your nose, forget about what the body looks like and where you are. Simply feel a coolness and a warmth. Can you feel that just in a field of space? Coolness appears and disappears. Warmth appears and disappears. Notice when you start thinking, it comes in words, it comes in a voice, it comes in pictures, it's okay. That's what the mind does, it thinks. This is vipassana. Just notice that it's thinking. You can say to yourself, thinking, thinking, thinking. It's just a process, it comes and goes. If you're seeing pictures, you could say seeing, seeing. Imagining, imagining. If you know it's the past, you could just say past or reflecting. Or if it's the future, future, future. Projecting, planning. And just come back to your breath. Feel the coolness. Feel the warmth. and relax. Relax your shoulders, relax your face, relax the whole body and let go of the body and simply feel. Coolness and warmth. What's your mind doing now? Whatever it's doing is okay. Just notice it. Is it thinking? Thinking, thinking, thinking. Maybe it's sleepy. Sleepy, sleepy, sleepy. Energize. Wake up. Come back to your breath. Come back to present. Or go freestyle. Hear the sounds, feel the sensation in the body, 
whatever sensation is there. Notice the thoughts. All processes, all experiences are coming and going. Every sound is a vibration. Every sensation in the body is a vibration. Every thought arises and passes away. And every mental state, every emotion, mental energy comes and goes. As humans, we operate by our five physical senses. Right now, feel your body. Feel your whole body. Feel the energy, the prana, the chi. Many sensations, but only one body and only one sense of feeling. The mind door the consciousness of feeling, sensation. And switch your awareness to hearing. The sense of hearing. constant changing process. Your mind is hearing, not just your ears, not just your brain. Mind. Consciousness of hearing. Smell the air. Whatever smell or scent there is. The sense of smelling, consciousness of smelling. And taste your mouth, whatever taste there may be. Sense of tasting, consciousness of tasting. And with your eyes closed, behind your eyelids, perhaps you see some color, some light, some shape, something moving, some energy behind your eyelids. The eyeballs, the functions of the eyes don't stop. We simply cover it with a thin layer of of skin. Your eyes are working. You just see the back of your eyelids. Maybe it's dark, maybe it's black. Maybe you see color or light or something changing. All of your senses are working. Your mind is working. Check yourself. Am I relaxed? Am I aware? Am I thinking? And how do I feel? When you are ready, 
in your own time and take your time if you wish you may open your eyes again see color light shape and when you are ready can start to move some fingers some toes and make yourself comfortable relax sit comfortably moving this is also part of Vipassana on a Vipassana retreat the meditation doesn't end as my teacher says the meditation begins when you wake up in the morning and it finishes when you fall asleep at night everything you do throughout the day is meditation having a drink is meditation moving your body is meditation your senses working is meditation <coughs> whatever is predominant is your object of meditation if we can remember this principle then we are fulfilling the Buddha's teachings fundamentally what the Buddha is suggesting is to be present and mindful as much as possible no matter where you go no matter what you do so fundamentally that also means everything is meditation sitting in a cafe or a restaurant is meditation driving your car is meditation talking to your children is meditation we develop this ability to observe that's what sati means the observation the mindfulness the presence of your mind and the presence is there to learn to understand the truth actually to remove the veil of ignorance from your mind unfortunately as little baby humans we are born into this world with ignorance we've forgotten our past lives we've forgotten the precious teachings that we received in past lives the lessons at least most of us have and we are left at the mercy of our parents our family members and then the society around us the teachings that are available to us wherever we are I wonder 
if you are able to take an in-breath without any thought. It's pretty easy really, isn't it? Good, I'm glad you agree. Take an in-breath without any thought. It's only one second, two seconds, maybe three at most. Can you do that? There's no thought there, right? It's really not difficult. And you're not forcing your mind to do that. You're not like, okay, stop thinking, I'm, I'm going to stop thinking and I'm going to breathe. It's not like that. You just feel your in-breath. That's all. You don't have to stop thinking. And I'm not saying stop thinking. Be very clear about this. We're not stopping anything. We are simply feeling the in-breath. And it's lovely. It's beautiful. Especially when you only feel that sensation of the in-breath. And in here, so nice, got the air conditioning on. So cool, refreshing, pleasant, cooling. You just feel that cool sensation. Only feel, no thought. And then you feel the warm air come out at, its, at the same place. It's very simple. If you can do that once, the in-breath and the out-breath, the cool sensation and then the warm sensation, they arise, well, there's no real place because it's your mind that's observing it. It's not about your nose. In the beginning, yes, it's nose. But if you can do as I suggested and you only feel coolness and warmth, there's no location. It's not in my nose as such. There's a cool sensation arises in your mind, in your awareness, and then the coolness disappears and the warm sensation takes its place. Coolness without any thought. Warmth without any thought. You just purified your mind. This is the teaching of the Buddha. Do it once in one breath. Actually, it's already enough. That's fantastic. How many people out there in the world actually do that? How many people really purify their mind for even one, one in-breath, one in-breath, one out-breath? There are not many. Think about your friends and your family. When did they ever stop and just go, and take a breath without any thought, no stress, no fear, no worry, no dukkha. Are you also aware that as you take that in-breath, there is no dukkha. You check it for yourself. Do it as many times as you like. There is no dukkha. There is no sukha. You're not suffering there. There's no pain or, or problem there. But there's no happiness, there's no joy, there's no excitement. It's not like, yay, I'm breathing. The mind is in upeka. Upeka means neither sukha nor dukkha, not unpleasant nor pleasant. It's something in between. This is what the Buddha was teaching, the middle way, something in between. There's something that exists that you can't see that it exists. Because it's not dukkha and it's not sukha. It's something in between. And you can experience it just in the simplicity of one breath. And repeat that. Not because you have to. You don't have to count how many breaths you're breathing. But once you feel that, and it's like, it's, it, it's kind of like, oh. Do you get it? It's like a little holiday. Did you feel it? One in-breath, one out-breath without any thought, you just had a holiday from yourself. 
You had a holiday from your ego. Because there's no stress. There's no fear. There's no worry. There's no competition. Nobody's in your mind going, checking, oh, did you do that right? Let me, let me evaluate your, your ability to observe your breath, your in-breath and your out-breath. There's nobody in there. There's no judge. There's no boss. There's no teacher. There's no parents. Thankfully, there's no kids. <laughs> it might be nice if there were kids in there, but nobody, and there's no you. That, that is probably the most difficult thing to understand. That even you disappear. And this is also one of the most important aspects of the Buddha's teachings. It's what makes the Buddha's teachings different from pretty much all other teachings. That when you look very, very carefully into your mind and body processes, you can't find yourself. There is no self. The awareness is not a self. Consciousness is not a self. These are energies, mental energies, that's all. They're like apps, applications, that's all. In your phone, you've got 30, 50 apps in there. They're just processes, that's all. They're not a self, they're not the controller, they're not the, the programmer. It's just a program. Your awareness is also a program. It's not a self. Only when you start saying, oh wow, there's no self in here. What's that? That's yourself. When your mind, when the ego, the self, kicks back in and says, oh wow, there's no self. Oh, that's self. Oh wow, that was cool. Oh, that's self. As soon as the mind starts talking to itself again, as soon as the thoughts kick back in, the judgment, the evaluation, the criticism, the, <coughs> the sukha, the dukkha, as soon as that all comes back in, that's what we call self. And everyone's got it. And it doesn't matter. You have a self or there's no self, it doesn't actually matter. Whether you're, it's better to know it than to not know it. But again, you see for yourself, take an in-breath. Any thought, take an out-breath. Any thought. That in-breath is observed simply by awareness. This breath also, as you've noticed, is very impermanent. That coolness, the coolness that arises is very impermanent. It just arises, you just feel the coolness, and then it's gone. And when, when it's gone, you feel the warmth, and then it's gone. Very impermanent, very transient. Even that coolness has a beginning, a middle, and an end. And the beginning of the coolness is not the middle, and the middle is not the end, and the end is not the beginning, and the beginning is not the end. And the it's just process, changing process. It's really simple, isn't it? This is how even just mindfulness of your breath can actually lead you to enlightenment. That's what has encouraged yogis for thousands of years to practice. Because even just the subtle awareness of an in-breath and an out-breath can lead you into that <coughs> excuse me, purification of the mind.
And when you realize that there's a purification of the mind, and that means that there is no self there, then you understand, ah, this teaching is true. Also, you realize there is no suffering there, there's no dukkha there. Then you also understand, dukkha, dukkha is also impermanent. Dukkha can be absent. So can sukha. And the attachment to both sukha and dukkha, the attachment is then gone. No attachment. Clear mind. Pure mind. Actually, that's about all you need to know. I should just send you all home now. You can all go home. That's about it. Just keep doing that. That's enough. Really. You can just go have lunch now. <laughs> I'm going to offer you a another little meditation. Oops, I said that word again. That M word. Actually, what I'd like you to do is maybe just have a little stretch, just not point your feet towards the Buddha or something, but just stretch your feet out to the side. Wake yourself up again. I see a few people starting to get a bit sleepy. <clears throat> neck rolls are also good just gently rolling your neck around I remember I saw someone's meditation program and they said it was like from 10 o'clock to 10.30 we meditate, sitting meditation and then five minutes neck rolls and then from <laughs> 10.35 to 11 I was like wow they specifically put neck rolls into the program, the day program and it's like wow that must be a really meaningful thing to do. So let's do some neck rolls. It's not in the program, but hey, this is freestyle. So you can freestyle roll your neck. Good for your spine. Also bending, like bending and your spine this way, bending your spine that way. Spine carries the energy to the brain. So moving your spine is really, really beneficial. <clears throat> Little twists are good, gently, very gentle twists. <clears throat> mm. So I'm going to offer you a a little movement meditation, but we're going to do it sitting. So it's going to be a hand movement. I'll just stand up to, so that you can see me. We're just going to sit in our normal meditation position. Going to put our hands like on our knees or wherever. And what I'm going to ask you to do is to raise one hand. So we're not doing it yet, I'll just explain it to you. Yes, you should stay before you go, just while I explain this. So we're just going to raise one hand very, very slowly. And then we're going to turn that hand over very, very slowly, like super slow. Really almost like you're going to go crazy slow. As slowly as you can. And then we'll place the hand flat and then we're going to 
bend the first finger in, only the first one, and take it by the thumb. And then we're going to release and unfold the finger, turn the hand over again, and slowly lower it down. Did you know that there's, there's one type of meditation that are, are vipassana that I didn't mention to you, and I don't know if anybody here has ever seen it, but there's a, a school in Thailand, and the, the, the monk that developed it is, is really quite famous, and a lot of people go. They do something like, in their sitting meditation, they move their hand up, they move it across, they move it down, they move it up, move it across, put it down, move up, back, down, up, back, down. And that's what they do. The, the whole meditation is, is, I don't know what the movement is, I never did it, but it's something like that. Has anybody ever heard of that or seen that, practiced it? Yeah? You, you've seen it? Yeah? Okay. Um, I can't remember the, the name of the Ajahn that developed it, but very curious because mostly we are taught in sitting meditation you sit still and you don't do anything but in that one it's, it's perfectly still me, uh, vipassana because like i'm telling you vipassana is mindfulness mindfulness can be applied to anything so it's really up to you what you want to apply mindfulness to so there's the um uh, yeah, so they do that, that particular star. So today we're just going to raise our hand, we're going to turn it over, going to pull that one first finger in, take it by the thumb, keep these other fingers straight, and then release the thumb, release the finger, turn it over, put it back down again. Yeah, very, very simple. I'll prompt you along the way. So... <coughs> Mindfulness in movement, or move, mindfulness of movement. If you'd like to go to the bathroom, you can go. Did you want to go? Oh, you went. You were on your way back. Oh, sorry. I thought you were on your way out. <coughs> so, it doesn't matter how you sit. If you sit in the chair, is also fine. Just put your hands... On your knees. Now, which hand, without thinking, which hand are you going to lift? Okay. Why? You're right handed? Okay. So we're going to do left hand. Okay. Change it up, switch it up, whichever hand that you instinctively wanted to move, use the other one. So if you're left-handed, use your right, whatever. Or, it doesn't matter, it's not about left-handed or right-handed, which hand did you instinctively want to start to move with? It could have been either. It's the same, have you ever thought, which foot do you start walking with? Maybe, maybe you'll have to check it out. We're, we, 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 even something as, as simple as that, many people would not be aware of what foot do I, start, do I start walking with. And you might be surprised, you might naturally say, oh, my right. But then you might realize, oh, sometimes I start with my left, or I do start with my left. It's not very important. But these little things that we start to learn through mindfulness, it's like when you brush your teeth. Do you follow the same format every time? Or do you change it round? Do you know how you brush your teeth? Do you know why you brush your teeth? <laughs> What's your intention in brushing your teeth? So we're going to practice this. Come in, please. Close the door. Thank you. <coughs> I 
I need to do a very quick introduction to our friends that just arrived. So it's both good timing and bad timing. And what did I say? Anything can happen. We're all set, we're just ready to go, and something happens. And it's all good. Hi friends, welcome. Uh, I need to, I'm talking to both of you because we, I've just explained the meditation that we're about to do so I need to bring you up to speed because we're going to do it right now. And I called it meditation again. <laughs> Mindfulness of movement is what we're going to do. We're going to sit still, put our hands on our knees and what we're going to do is we're going to lift one hand very, very, very slowly. We're going to turn that hand over until it's flat, perfectly flat, we're going to curl the first finger and we're going to hold it with the thumb. And then we're going to let go of that finger and unfold the finger, make it straight. We're going to turn the hand over and put it back down again. Very simple. Yeah? That's the meditation. So, it's not, it's not an exercise of your hand. That's not the purpose. We, know, we all know our hands work very well. It's like um, breathing meditation is not to exercise your breathing. This is mind training. We are training our mind, firstly, to just be present, to observe physical processes so that <clears throat> when, we, when we are more present, we can observe physical processes, later on the mindfulness will be then able to observe mental processes. And that's, why are we observing mental processes? Because that's where the dukkha is. That's where the suffering is. If you would like to become free from suffering, even eventually completely free, or along the way, reduce your suffering, then you need to see what is the cause of the suffering. Where is the suffering coming from in the first place? Because if you remove the cause, you will remove the effect. This is a natural law. This is karma. It's always been this way. Because there is a cause, there is an effect. You can't have an effect without a cause. There must be a cause. And if you want to remove the effect, you simply remove the cause. If there's no cause, there's no effect. Very simple, very clear, very scientific, and it's always been this way. It was this way before the Buddhists and the, the Hindus and the Vedas and all the other teachings came along. Human beings did not create the law of karma. They discovered it. It's like gravity. I was talking to you about gravity. Gravity is not made up by humans, but we all experience it. We understand it. We discovered it. Why we keep sticking to the ground? Why we can't, you know, just float up in the air? Ah, there's a natural law that makes you stuck to the ground. There's a natural law that governs how your body and mind work. It's simply called karma and it's operating every moment the same as gravity the same as your breathing in your breathing out the same as your heart the same as the physical systems of your body they don't stop they're 24 7 working all the time natural laws natural processes natural energy all right let's do this little experiment we don't know what will happen Anything can happen, right? We're just going to watch and learn from whatever happens. In this way, we clear our expectations. I tell myself, not only is meditation an experiment, but for me, life is an experiment. An experiment is when you do something 
and you see how it turns out. What's the results? Have you done this life before? We haven't. We've done other lives, but we haven't done this one. We've done other meditations before. You haven't done this one. You've had other breaths before, but you haven't had this one. So we keep watching, learning, experimenting, feeling, and new experiences are coming all the time. All right. We will, other than <clears throat> the movement of the hand, we will remain still as much as possible. I'd like everyone to close their eyes for this. Even if you're not doing it, please don't open your eyes because I want everyone to feel safe that you're not being observed or judged or anything. Everybody closes their eyes and feel safe. Feel where your body contacts with the mat, the cushion. Feel the weight of the body. Feel the pressure of the body. This is gravity at work. You have no choice about this. You can change your position, but you're always contacting the earth in some way. Even your hands, the heaviness of your hands is pressing on your legs. Feel your back straight. Roll your shoulders up and back and down. Maybe raise the crown of your head a little. Sit up nice and straight with good energy. Take a nice, long, deep breath in. Nice, long, deep breath out. Nice, slow breath in, slow breath out. Really feel the sensation of the in-breath and the out-breath. As you breathe in, relax your face, Breathe out, relax your face. Breathe in, relax your body. Breathe out, relax your body. Enjoy breathing. Fully live in each in-breath and each out-breath. Can you take and can you feel an in-breath without any thought? Can you feel an out-breath without any thought? Bring your awareness to the hand that you are going to move. Feel that hand touching your leg. Now feel your leg where your hand is touching it. There are two separate sensations here. One 
is feeling the hand touching the leg. The other is the leg feeling the hand touching it. Can you differentiate between the sensation in your hand and the sensation in your leg? And now, very, very, very slowly. This whole process could take 15 minutes. There's no rush. In fact, do it as slowly as you can. When you are ready, you may begin to lift that hand. I am practicing this with you, my eyes are closed. Slow down, go even slower. Turn the hand over in your own time. Very, very slowly. You're probably imagining what your hand looks like. Can you delete that mental image and just feel the hand? If you're talking to yourself in your head, just quieten it down and just feel the hand moving. When the hand becomes flat, palm up, extend your fingers, make them straight. And in your own time, very, very slowly, begin to bend the first finger the slowest you've ever done anything.
very slowly bring the thumb to hold the first finger straighten the other fingers If you're not there, it's okay, take your time, as slowly as you can. And when you're ready, begin the journey back. Very slowly, let go of the finger, put the thumb back. of any thought, come back to the finger, the hand. Relax your shoulders, your face. Try to go back slower than when you came. your hand is back on your knee. Keep your eyes closed. We continue with the breath, with the senses.
once the hand is back down. What's happening in your body and mind? What are, you aware, what are you aware of now? What is happening now? breath is still breathing by itself. The heart is beating continuously. All the systems of your body are working harmoniously together by themselves, by natural law. Your senses are all working also by natural law, cause and effect. And the mind is present. Check yourself. Am I aware? Am I present? Am I thinking? And how do I feel? Check, how do I feel? Your mental state. Can you give it a one-word answer? How do I feel now? It doesn't have to be positive or beautiful. It just needs to be honest. How do I feel now? And when you are ready, feel free to start to move your hands, your toes, your feet. Feel free to open your eyes and have a little stretch. Relax, sit comfortably.
can you still be mindful now? What you're doing, moving, stretching, drinking. So I wonder how that went for you, that experiment. <coughs> Good. Does anybody have a quick comment about that experience? Something to share. For some of you it would have been the first time to do such a thing. Some of you might have done similar things before. Any comment? Anything to share? And you mentioned that to do not visualize the image of the hand turning, do not mentally tell yourself from the hands. I was doing exactly all that. Yes. You were saying, why do we not do the, that? Just, just to get a different experience, because that's what we all do. I close my eyes, and if I think about my body or I'm, I, I'm aware that I'm sitting, I actually somehow visualize my body sitting here. But if you clear that from your mind, then you will feel the body, not see a mental picture. These are two different experiences. One is a mental image that your mind is doing, and we usually pay attention to that. But what I wanted you to do was to feel the experience in the hand, not just visualize the hand. But unfortunately, the, the moment you say do not visualize, uh, do not tell, that's when it, it uh, became stronger. Stronger, yes. That's okay also. So yeah. in the end, it, I was like clinging, don't visualize, don't visualize, don't talk, and it became, yeah, it stuck onto that. <laughs> but then you forgot the word that I said was just feel. So you went to the, don't visualize, don't yeah. visualize. I was also say, just feel. So it's a little experiment, but I'm glad that you mentioned it because many people probably had the same experience. Thank you. Anybody else? I felt very calm. And throughout the whole process, I was feeling a sense of calmness all over. I couldn't even feel my body. Mm. And when you said open your eyes, I didn't even feel opening my eyes. Yes. So it was a very calming experience. Yeah, beautiful. Do you know why it was calming? I don't know, I just felt it. Okay. <laughs> Anybody answer the question? Why did it feel calming? What was there an absence of? Mostly. There was an absence of thinking. In fact, for many of you, because you were given a task to do, and because it was so unusual and so different, your minds were really closely observing that whole movement. So there were very few thoughts in your mind. You were very present for about that whole, it took maybe about 20 minutes. So for many of you, you were more present for that 20 minutes than if I said to you, all right, let's all sit for meditation for 20 minutes. You would have just sat there and thought for 20 minutes, constant thinking for 20 minutes under the, under the name of meditation. We all have good intention to meditate. There's nothing wrong with our good intentions. But when we sit down, we lose the idea, why am I doing this? That's why I asked you this morning, why am I meditating? Why did I come here today? What's my purpose? Keep coming back to your intention. What's my intention to sit here and meditate now? And when we are given some small task to do, 
often the mind will be much more present doing that than just sitting and doing absolutely nothing. So it's a little experiment. I'm not saying now, every time you meditate, that you do this hand movement. In fact, the next time you do it, it probably won't even work. You'll just be thinking the whole time, oh, am I doing it right? Oh, did we do this? What the, oh, how does it work? Oh, gee, I did it better last time. Oh, da, 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 da. It probably won't really work. It works for me. I do this very often, but still for me, I'm really in the process. And it really clears my mind as well. So, whenever you have a good meditation, whenever meditation goes very well for you, then prepare yourself the next time because it's either going to go really bad and it's going to, yeah, it's really not going to work for you unless you do what I said at the beginning of this meditation. I don't know what will happen. This meditation is not my last meditation. I don't know what will happen. Anything can happen. It could be better, it could be worse. But anything can, can happen. And what's my job? Just to observe any a mental or physical process in the present. Whatever comes, that's my object of awareness. Thank you. Yeah. Does anybody else have something to share? Um, yeah, <clears throat> thank you so much for that. Uh, I'm just wondering um, what role do you think these movements have in quieting the internal monologue that sort of arises when we're trying to sort of um, calm the mind? Mm. Uh, are you specifically referring to monologue or just any mental chattering? Um, yeah, I think generically, any sort of mental chatter. Right, because there's a big difference between monologue and I did mention it while we were doing it, that you will actually be giving a commentary. Oh, my hand's doing this. Oh, my finger's doing that. Oh, now I'm doing this. Now I'm doing that. So the mind, it's like, it can't shut up. Even it's talking to itself. It knows nobody's listening, but it still has to give a commentary. You know, like a football match. Like, oh, number seven's gone, taking the ball off. Oh, look, number eight is... It's like the mind's going, oh... And now, oh, and look at the thing. Oh, the finger's doing that. Oh, wow. Oh, it feels like this. So even that, we need to look at that. We're not, as I've said be before you came, in this practice of vipassana, we are not stopping the mind from doing it. When I said clear the mind earlier, so it was not so much don't visualize, but Simply clear the mind, but come to feel something. So we're actually replacing thinking with feeling. This is, this is, and it's the answer to your question, that instead of thinking about your hand moving or visualizing your hand moving, you simply feel the movement. And we're not actually trained to do this. We're trained to think, and by default, we visualize. So mostly what we're doing in our life is we're visualizing and imagining when we're not doing anything out there in the world, or we are actually actively engaged in the world around us. In this moment, what we've done is we've come internally, we're feeling an internal process, not just the ac external hand movement, but actually what you're doing is you're feeling the actual sensation of the bending of the finger, the movement of the thumb, the straightening, etc., etc. You will find, if you do that correctly, that it becomes a very, very different experience to almost anything that you've ever done in your life. Now, how that translates into daily life is that when I even when I stand up from this position and I, I actually notice ah, the movement of this foot, the touching of the floor. Now I need to move my, like I need to balance my weight. I need to put this hand here 
or put that hand there. I need to pull this foot out, pull it forward. All of these take mental intentions. All of these are decision-making processes. This is also karma. It's very, doesn't carry any weight to it, but it's actually cause and effect intentions, decision-making processes. If you can watch even something simple like how you sit down, how you move your body, how you make intentions to take something, to do something, to put it back, <clears throat> then this small training in mindfulness then starts to expand out into the bigger decisions that we make in life. And even we learn to just pause for a moment before we do something. This morning, I asked you all, before we paid our respects to the Buddha, the Dharma and the Sangha, I remember we, what did we do? Composed our minds. You press pause for a moment. I'm going to do something here. Why am I doing it? What's my intention to do it? Pause. Be mindful. Even breathe in. Breathe out. Look at the Buddha image, look at the flowers, look at the beautiful little bonsai bodhi there. Look at the pagoda, look at the colors, the lights, the flames, if there's flame. And notice, take in the details, be present, be mindful, compose your mind. Now what am I going to do? And do it with conscious awareness. Even the bowing down to the Buddha, the Dharma and the Sangha is a meditation. It must be meditation. It's not just, ah, oh, yeah, la, bow down three times, oh, I do it because mum told me or my teacher said or everybody else does it or something. No. Why am I doing this? This is my karma. I'm bowing down to the Buddha, the Dharma and the Sangha in this very moment. What am I doing? What decisions am I making? So that's how this very simple exercise can actually then translate. Where now we're going to go for lunch. And before we all tuck in and, and eat our lunch, I'm actually going to do, we're going to do eating meditation. When we're down there, I'll give you some tips on how, firstly, to slow down. Be mindful of your senses. Do one thing at a time. Experience life while you are eating food. Was there anybody else that would like to make a... Oh, there were a couple of people. Go. Do you want... Floyd? Thank you, Mike Runner. I'll just call you Mike for short. Mike, thanks, Mike. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, just sh share my experience. Uh, when I do it slow, now I cannot. <laughs> when I do it slow, I can feel actually there's like there's something like separation between the leg and the hand, and when I, when do it slow, I can feel there's a heat coming up. And it's something like the sensation heat, then sometimes it's cold, and yeah, I just make the movement, everything. Is it is it the right? Is it something this that we person like uh, nodding, aware? I'm not sure. <laughs> so everybody has their own experience, and even in something simple like lifting your hand, everybody is having their own experience. So there's no right or wrong. And what you experience is what you experience. Some people might be aware of the, the lightness of the hand. Some people might be aware that there's still heat sensation in the, in the leg, or um, they may feel heat in their hand. They may feel coolness in their hand. It's, it's all up to you. So, um, yes, you will have those experiences. And it's all purely your own experience. It's just an experiment. Yeah. So that's perfectly right and fine. Mm. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, my question is not specific to this. 
the medita meditation that we did just now while i was throughout this session why there were small pockets of bliss happiness that was coming to me and there was a smile in my face automatically so my question is how long can we be in that state when we say that uh, there is there should not be i mean neither there should be dukkha nor sukha and we should be following the middle path mm. of upekha right so is it all right if i feel that bliss for example <laughs> when you told about the flames and the little things that give you joy is it okay for that of course it is it's perfectly fine and many buddhists misunderstand this they think that they should not have desires they should not be happy or something it's not it's not about that it's about understanding what is the cause for happiness to arise how long does happiness last and what's the cause for happiness to disappear why does happiness come and as you said almost you weren't expecting it uh, just some little waves of joy or happiness bliss come up what was the cause for them there must be a cause what's the cause for the bliss the happiness to arise why does it last for some time but why does it pass away so we do the same thing with dukkha as well why does dukkha arise what's the cause for dukkha why does dukkha last why does dukkha pass away why does upekha arise why does it last why does it pass away so it's not about i should have more of this i i shouldn't have that i want more of this i get rid of that if that's what your mind is doing you should be aware of this the attachment to these states or the rejecting or resistance of these states now you're looking at something very different it's not about the sukha or the dukkha it's about the resistance and the attachment or the desire now start watching these mental states these are more important than the actual dukkha or the sukha even how they came or why they came and how they disappeared also becomes irrelevant it's how does the mind react to those mental states because that's also where your dukkha is in the resistance or the pushing away and the attachment and grasping on to something this is the true state of the point of this meditation and then you'll start to understand why does the mind resist why does the mind attach and grasp and that's where the true i believe that's where the true wisdom arises and that's where we actually fall more and more often into the upekha state that state of neither this nor that mm. thank you i thank you and the guy behind you would like to did you want go oh, no okay. yeah my as well <laughs> <laughs> i remember the last retreat i went yeah bali with you six, yeah seven years ago so after that retreat right um it was an intense awareness alertness in the mind of the things that you do because it was a drastic change that was my first uh, retreat back then um that awareness created a heaviness because it was like you exert that focus um eventually it becomes like i, I don't know is it cuz uh came across the very first spiritual path so uh it turns out to be it's pretty heavy when you keep exerting that awareness um how do you resolve that right so <clears throat> There are a few elements here but sometimes when we when we learn um mindfulness for the first time and we see that it really works we've heard about it and then we go oh wow this really works then and of course you get good experience from it so you want to keep it you want to grasp onto it so you put in effort and that effort can make it tiresome can make it difficult so many people when they come back from retreat they feeling so high so relaxed so cool from retreat that they don't want to let that go they want to hold on to that but the holding on to it and the exerting of too much effort to be mindful can give you this experience that it's actually tiresome or difficult or troublesome or something like that that's when we need to come back to the the principle of vipassana 
and that is to simply observe any mental or physical process that's predominant now. That's all you have to do. It's just, basically you're just asking, what's happening now? What's happening now? What's happening now? And you just go through your day, just checking in with yourself. What's happening now? What do I feel in my body? What do I feel in my mind? So the last thing that I asked you at the end of that meditation, oops, I said it again, at the end of that experience was, how do I feel? Do you remember the word that you found in your mind? At the end of that practice, I asked, how do I feel? And I said, can you find a one word answer for how do I feel in my mind now? Does anybody remember their word? Do you want to share it? Just shout it out if you want. Mine was curiosity. Wonder. wonder. Nice, it was almost the same. Curiosity, wonder. Mm. And? Anything can happen. Okay. Okay, one word answer for a, a feeling in your mind. So anything can happen is not the answer that you would give to that question. How do I feel now is an emotion. What is the feeling I feel in my heart now? Calm? Peace? Yeah. Agitated. Perfect. Because that's what I said. It doesn't need to be beautiful. It needs to be honest. And honesty here means also real. If you're agitated, you know you're agitated. If you're angry, you know you're angry. If you're um, stressed, you know you're stressed. If you're feeling in bliss, you know you're in bliss. So it's not about giving a lovely answer to the question, you're not trying to impress anybody, least of all me, but you're not even trying to impress yourself. Why would you do that? Honesty is probably the best way to impress yourself. By being perfectly honest and clear with yourself about how you feel now. Does anyone want to give an answer now how you feel? Sleepy? Lazy? Lazy? Hungry. Huh? <laughs> Hungry. <laughs> Hungry is, is it mental or physical? <laughs> Have a look at it. Physical. Let's see. Let's see how it goes when we go downstairs. So, mindfulness in a when we do vipassana retreats, as I've said, everything becomes our practice. So even like we just did with our hand movement was just an example that you can watch physical processes and physical movements as part of your meditation. So when you uh, stand up, will also be part of our meditation. Walking to the dining room will also be part of the meditation. If you like, you can even do a very simple walking meditation. We include, we use metta, we can say happy, healthy, happy, healthy. Very simple. Take a step, say happy, take a step, say healthy. See how far you can go just by saying that in your mind. It helps if you slow down. If you've done vipassana retreats, especially in the Mahasi technique, you realize that we do very slow walking. We're going to do some slow eating as well. So really just take your time. And um, going to the bathroom. Just notice when you're opening the door, closing the door, when you're lifting the lid, when you're adjusting your clothing, when you are flushing the toilet, when you're 
washing your hands. Just slow everything down a little bit. There are plenty of toilets. Every floor has three or four toilets. There's no waiting, I think. Also, in the corner here, as you go out, and in the corner, there are stairs. There's also a lift. Some people need to take the lift. Most of us don't need to take the lift. I live, in a, I live on the seventh floor of the building that I live in here. I've been here three weeks. I think for the past two weeks, I haven't used the lift once, not once. And I park, um, I go from the ground floor, which is two car parks, and then seven floors, so it's nine floors. I walk up and down, sometimes two or three, sometimes maybe four times a day. Great place to do mindfulness practice. It's excellent for your body, good for your legs, uh, good for your heartbeat, your breath, your just about everything. Um, and being aware of just taking one step at a time. You know, there's no point at being at level four and going, oh, I've got another three levels to go, oh, I can't do this, oh, I did this, this is the third time I did this today. What am I doing? I'm just creating dukkha for no reason whatsoever. If I just take one step at a time, where am I going to get to? I'll get to where I have to go. All I have to be aware of is one step, one step, one step, one step. It doesn't matter if I'm, going, if I'm climbing up the, the KLCC tower. If I want to get to the top, I, it's just one step. It's only one step. That's all you have to do. One step and then one step. And one step and one step. One of the problems with us human beings is that we calculate. And we add and we subtract and we divide and we multiply and we create so many problems for ourselves. The only number, and many of you computer geeks out here will also be aware of this, but actually it's a scientific fact, there's only one number that exists. One. The other is zero, and that zero is actually not really a number. It's the absence of one. So there's only num one number that actually exists. There's only one of anything in the universe. If there's two, like two fingers, we say these are two, right? It's not two. It's one and one. Yeah? Everything. It applies to everything. There are not 30 people in this room. There's one. And one, 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 one. Everything, uh, this applies to everything in the world. So when you're doing something, just do one at a time. And just do this one. It's very simple. Your mind calms down. You're just doing one thing at a time. So when we go down, when you select your food, take what you need, what you don't need, if there's extra or, you know, whatever, give back what you don't want to eat. Be careful about that because your eyes, if you're hungry, then your eyes are like, oh, I want to eat so much, and then you get halfway and you go, oh, I'm already full. So better to take a little bit out and take a little bit less. I found this last week, actually, when we were here. I was like, oh, I should have taken some out of this. But once you start eating, you can't take it out, but you can always put more in later. So start by taking some of the food out, eat a little bit less. If you need more, you go back and get some more, okay? And, but don't eat yet. Take your food, sit down at the table, and everybody just sit with your food. Don't taste anything, don't eat anything, don't put any food in your mouth yet. And then we'll do a very short mindfulness of eating experiment. Okay?